Hey, welcome back to the Post Industrial Podcast. I'm your host, Carmen Gentile. Today we have a very special guest, Pennsylvania Democratic Congressman Chris Deluzio. Check it out. Thanks for joining me on the Post Industrial Podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Carmen, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm going to ask you what I like to ask all reasonable, uh, measured lawmakers who either of either party or any party. Um, what's it like to sit in that chamber with folks who don't believe that the 2020 election was won by Biden, who uh, believe in a number of uh ill-founded and ill-conceived conspiracy theories who don't believe in <laughs> the last 70 years of uh, U.S.-led um, world order post-World War II. What, what do you do as someone who has not only served their country, but uh, has a law degree and has a, a measured temperament, as best I can tell? Uh, how do you deal with that? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so, Carmen, I'll tell you, it'd be one thing if, say, election deniers... Uh, were some tiny fringe, right? You could almost, by virtue of the insanity of their views, would be marginalized, mm -hmm. right? You, know, you had a majority of House Republicans vote to overthrow the election, vote to throw out Pennsylvania's electoral college votes, my vote, uh, my constituents' votes in 2020. Uh, I think eight of nine House Republicans from Pennsylvania voted against certifying our own election results, uh, accepting the electors, I should say. So it's not just a fringe. And it's not only that it's not just a fringe, the Republicans are in the majority. And the speaker, Mike Johnson, was one of the architects of this whole legal strategy to try to overthrow the election and make Donald Trump the president after losing. So to answer your question, uh, it's a little bit terrifying because they're in charge. Um, it's something I worry about and plenty of folks who I represent and all over this country, I think, worry about it correctly. And it makes the normal work of legislating, of lawmaking, where you have to have some back and forth, where you serve on committees together, where you have to find some compromise on bills that aren't as controversial. It makes that work pretty tough. When I know that a lot of the times someone who I'm having a conversation with who's in the other party, um, and normally we would just have our disagreements and fine, we can work together on this thing. Well, I, I've got that nagging thought in my head of, oh, man, you tried to throw my vote out. You wow. tried to facilitate Donald Trump becoming president after losing the election. So, you know, and I don't paint with a broad brush. This is not where all Republicans are. But there are a lot of people in Congress who are there. And it comes back to me of elections, them having consequences and why we have to beat people who aren't committed to this democracy. Who I don't think should be wielding power in Washington um, because I worry about what they might try to do. And the next time uh, a guy like Trump or Trump tries to do something anti-democratic like January 6th. So those folks are there. They wield some power, and it ought to worry people. It worries me being in the metaphorical and literal room, you know, now as someone who gets to serve in Congress. Well, as someone who sits in that room and has to deal with that power, do you see that power maybe waning were Trump not to win the next election, that maybe we could have a return to a more normal, <laughs> normal yeah. uh, political um, uh, uh, back and forth? I hope so. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to give some grand prediction on where the internal dynamics of the Republican Party might be. Uh, I hope they will return to a place where we're arguing and debating over taxing and spending and whether unions should have some power and all the normal things, which, by the way, I think Democrats win those arguments. Um, we can have debates about reproductive freedom. And again, I think we're in the right place. I wish our debates were just that. I don't think we're there yet. You know, I think it's still a situation in this country where lots of uh, candidates, for instance, Republican candidates who, after they lose, make a call and concede to their opponent and issue a public statement. You know, we're still having to lift that up as like, that's a good job. Well, that used to be the bare minimum that was expected of candidates who lost an election. Uh, I, I'm fine to acknowledge when they do that and it's the right thing and we should try to restore some of those norms. Um, but I don't know what the easy path is back to having a normal, strong, functional democracy where Republicans and Democrats and independents and whoever else are just competing in elections and no one worries about whether the loser will honor them. You know, I think we have to do the hard work of restoring trust. I've been trying to do some of that with my work on ethics reform, congressional stock trading bans and things like that that go toward trust in government. But I can't legislate people complying with the norms. 
I can't legislate a guy like Trump not egging on a January 6th attack on the Capitol. I can't legislate somebody willing to cast out an election they know they lost or refusing to concede after they've lost an election. You know, I, those are norms. Those are in people's hearts. Those are behaviors. I think society has to expect that of people, but I know we have work to do, and, and I don't know where the far right is willing to go and where they're going to push the Republican Party after this election. Well, you recently put out a paper uh, making suggestions for how to come back from this form of extremism. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, part of it, and I'm, I'm doing this in a defend democracy agenda in a bunch of waves, and the first piece of this to me is around try to earn back some trust in government. It goes to ethics. It goes to the corrupting influence of money in politics. Uh, I, I mentioned stock trading. You know, I don't think members of Congress who sit in these briefings and hearings and get access to lots of information you know, should be enriching themselves buying and selling stock, for instance. That's, and they have over the years. They have. Members yeah. of both parties. Let's be right. clear about no, that. No, that's very clear. Yeah. And when you pull this stuff, you look at surveys, most people don't think that members of Congress should do that either. So there are things like that that we can do that I think help grow some trust and earn back some trust. Um, it's not just that. I mean, there's, there's going to be more, and I've been, I'll be doing more publicly around voting rights, mm -hmm. election security, and other parts of this. Um, but I think if we can't earn back the trust, if we can't see maps that are fair, where elect candidates have to compete and could win or lose, right? In my kind of a district, a Democrat or Republican has to compete, or Democrat and Republican have to compete if they want a shot to win. It's not just winning their primary. We have competitive general election in a district like mine. That's rare. Most members of Congress don't have competitive general elections. Most competitive elections you see, it's super PACs with typically corporate money flowing through buying TV ads and digital ads and all the rest. I think a lot of these things are linked. Uh, I think that, that faith and trust in government is not an easy thing to fix. It's not just one piece of it. I'm trying to do everything I can to be part of fixing it. Uh, but we have... I think a lot of work to do and it doesn't just um, it's not going to be fixed overnight and it's also a problem that it didn't just happen overnight well you uh, as a veteran uh, seem to take your patriotic duty as an American not as a lawmaker but as an American uh, seriously and you have a very distinct idea of what it means to be a patriot and the reason I mention this is because you wrote something for Post Industrial that I want to read a segment of <coughs> and I'm going to uh find a line here that I can actually make out. Okay. These right-wing extremists and insurrectionists act like they own the flag, often dressing up in military person uh dressing up as military personnel and wrapping themselves in the stars and stripes. Every American should reject this delusional claim to patriotism. Every patriotic American understands that government by uh, of by and for the people is a lot stronger than the misplaced loyalty of armed extremists. How do you, in your estimation, reach those Americans, a lot of which are likely constituents or, mm -hmm. or in your district who probably wouldn't have voted for you, but um, in parts of Pennsylvania, states like Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, Michigan, where a lot of these extremist uh, groups have taken hold, how do you convince those folks that believe deeply that their form of patriotism is a patriotism that is in the is the right form of patriotism, is the patriotism in the best interests of, uh, of America. Well, I'll start by telling a little bit of a story. And it's, talk about my time in the Navy, but it's not unique to my own military experience or others, but I think it, it illustrates some of this. So, you know, I was in the Navy. I served, um, you know, different shifts of watch on the bridge of a ship. And when you would be up, you know, in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, you're serving with Americans from every walk of life, right? One of the few places in American society and life where you really have people from all parts of the country, uh, all different kinds of backgrounds working together for a common purpose. We, we don't have a lot of that in this country anymore. It's a problem. Uh, but what I didn't really ever hear in my time in service was someone claiming they had some monopoly on how they're supposed to love this country or that their political or religious views or otherwise should be forced on everyone else by the government. Um, it's divisive. It's just not an American tradition to have that kind of thought. And, you know, we can all love this country in different ways and clamor for it to be better. I think that's very patriotic. Uh, I don't think trying to destroy our Constitution is patriotic. I don't think claiming a mantle of because of your political beliefs, you have a monopoly on loving this country is very patriotic. And certainly not while you're doing things to destroy representative democracy 
uh, while you've contributed to corporate power that has hurt so many regions like Western Pennsylvania that saw so many factories and mills and jobs go overseas driven by that same corporate ideology. I, you know, I, I don't think wrapping yourself in the flag while you're doing that uh, is terribly patriotic. And so what I'm trying to share with folks and do it not just in a, an essay, but in, in actions is, look, we are in a moment where there are real threats to our freedom, to this government of ours, and we should continue to have the partisan disagreements. That's fine. That's normal. Um, but when we have existential threats to our democracy, I think people have to be united and clear-eyed about coming together to say this anti-democratic stuff is out of bounds. It's not. It's out of the norm. We're going to reject it at the polls, whoever's doing it. And I'm hopeful that we'll see that in the elections to come and we can see things cool off in this country. But uh, I, I'm not naive about uh, the likelihood of that happening overnight. What do you think about Pennsylvania heading into 2024? Not your own prospects, but uh, top of the ticket and then further down. Are you concerned about Pennsylvania as, you know, Pennsylvania went for Trump in 2016 and the first time I, I believe that the state had voted Republican since 88? And so it had been solidly a, a blue state uh, during that period. Trump in 2016, Biden won it, but it was close in 2020. What do you, what do you hear in across the state? What do you hear from, from your constituents? I, I think there is no world where Pennsylvania is not going to be a battleground presidential, certainly. Senator Casey, who I think is going to win re-election, will have a very competitive election uh, with control of the Senate hanging in the background or hanging in the balance. And of course, you've got several congressional seats like mine that are very competitive. And you've got a state house that has a one vote majority right now for the Democrats. We're going to have tons of competitive elections. That's normal for people around here. We're used to this. Um, and, and look, I, I think you're going to see some of the worst parts of what Donald Trump is peddling. He's going to come here and say it and do it. And uh, I, I think we reject it. You know, I, I think uh, what he is selling, what he is offering, his willingness. I mean, he's talked about at rallies, the people who stormed the Capitol who are in, who've gone to trial and been convicted. He's talked about calling them political prisoners. He's had recordings of them singing from jail or prison. He's talked about freeing them should he be president. I mean, these are people who attacked the seat of our government, trying to overthrow the election, trying to block the counting of electoral college votes. Uh, I, I think the American people want nothing to do with it. Now, it's not to say that's the only thing our election will be about. Of course not. People talk to me about the cost of living and the cost of things. They talk about immigration, abortion, a whole range of issues, public safety, you name it. Um, but I think this looming threat to our democracy is going to be there. And I think in Pennsylvania, especially where so many uh, on the far right in Harrisburg or otherwise were part of this movement in 2020 coming into January 6th, um, we're going to reject it. I feel pretty confident about that. Switching gears, when it comes to veterans, we, have, we saw 20 years of war in Afghanistan, almost as long in, in Iraq, uh, conflicts around the world where uh, U.S. servicemen and women are being injured. You yourself served. Um, in the years subsequent to these, to these conflicts, we're going to see more and more veterans uh, with lifelong ailments. We've already seen traumatic brain injuries, um, respiratory illnesses due to burn pits, and a number of other war-related maladies, just like we had in Vietnam. We had from Agent Orange, we had Gulf War Syndrome, the first Gulf War, and, and now these maladies that are common to uh, veterans. How uh, are, are veterans associated, how's the VA doing in handling these, um, this, what's going to be a problem for decades to come, in your estimation? Well, and if, if the VA is successful, all of my fellow veterans who are eligible for care should be in. Right? They should be receiving care in the VA system, receiving disability compensation if, based on their ratings and all the rest. So if, if the VA does its job well, we aren't leaving veterans behind who are eligible for care and benefits they've earned, which means there's a lot of, a lot of growth of who could be coming into the VA from my generation, even Vietnam era. Uh, some of the provisions in the PACT Act aren't just about post 9-11 mm -hmm. generation veterans. Uh, but it took, what, it's 20 years to get the PACT Act signed um, 20 years of those wars in the Middle East. And that's a long time. You talk to the Vietnam generation, you know, they had to get wins in the PACT Act too for uh, making sure those veterans exposed to materials and substances that have hurt them. 
it's decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be honest, you know, I, I sat in a Veterans Affairs Committee hearing a couple weeks ago. I serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, when my Republican counterparts were proposing a bill to cap and, and essentially, <laughs> essentially defund uh, the cost of war toxic exposure fund, even wanting to cut the name cost of war from the fund. And, you know, my point is, number one, you ask the American people, should we pay for the care of our veterans who we send to fight, who we send to serve? The answer is absolutely we should. This is the reason we say the cost of war. It's not just bombs and planes and tanks and armor and all the rest. It's the humans who we send to fight, the wounds they may bear, invisible or otherwise, for years to come. American people expect us to pay for it. And, you know, I'm listening to my Republican counterparts who just, you know, go on and on and on about fiscal responsibility and how can we ever pay for all this while they're doing tax cuts for billionaires. It's like, my guys, you're coming after veterans care is your solution to fiscal crisis? Maybe look in the mirror and stop giving tax cuts to billionaires and huge corporations. Uh, I also think, and maybe I don't know if this is a crazy idea, but if we're going to vote to send Americans off to fight, we can estimate what those costs of caring for veterans will be, and we should upfront say that and commit to funding it. That's not something this country has done traditionally. Uh, it's something I'm going to work on in the Congress because I think we know there will always be costs when we send Americans in harm's way. If you ask the American people if we should pay for it and commit to doing it up front, they'll say yes. And yet Congress hasn't done that. When you're in the Veterans Affairs Committee, when you're sitting down, looking across the aisle, talking to folks on that committee about how to, to fund this care for veterans, and they're telling you that they want to cut, how do you, how, <laughs> how do they justify that to their constituents back home? I'm not asking you to be a fly on the wall of, yeah, of, of I, another and let me be clear. person's constituency, I, but I, I how serve, do you do that? I, I serve in that committee with several of my Republican colleagues who have worn the uniform, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, given this country a lot, mm -hmm. who I... And I'm not talking about all of them. So I think several, a lot of them understand those are their brothers and sisters in arms, mm -hmm. and we should be taking care of them. Um, but there are powerful networks on the right, you know, who have as a stated goal to gut the VA, turn it into a voucher system, so they can keep government funding uh, down to keep tax cuts for big, powerful companies. The Koch brothers network for years has done that through CVA and other groups. Uh, so there's an ideology over there that is all about, you know, this trickle-down economics fairy tale, and they're willing to do it in veterans' care and veterans' affairs. They're willing to do it all throughout our government. So it's it's an ideology I disagree with, and uh, to see it play out where you're willing to go after the care of veterans exposed to burn pits um, is just baffling. I, I could not purport to understand why that's the solution. This might seem like a little bit of inside baseball questioning about the, the politicking of, of a particular situation, but how do you, as a congressman, go to your constituents who may, uh, you know, who may be on the fence about voting for you and are willing to um, vote against or entertain the idea of voting against their own interests, like tax cuts for billionaires or cut to VA benefits or cuts to Medicare and Medicaid? How do you go in there and explain to folks they might be not voting in their best interest. How well, do you do that? Look, I start with some humility. I don't ever purport to, to tell someone or know, you know, what is in your absolute best interest, whether it's economic issues you care about or you're worried about whether you and your family are safe. I, I start with some humility. You know, I don't know where everyone might be, but I think the evidence is pretty clear when you talk about economics. This trickle down nonsense, they call it a fairy tale, it's never worked. Right? It's, it's led to not just gapping or massive inequality. It's been bad for growth. It's been bad for jobs. It's been bad for economic activity. Uh, you see the difference between now we're investing in our manufacturing. We're given UC unions on the rise. Uh, you see the investment in public works and infrastructure. We've had exceptional job growth as a result. You're seeing paychecks rise faster than costs. Right? Those are indicia of a different kind of economic um, program. And the eras in our country, I think people think of the golden age of capitalism coming out of World War II. Well, we had much less inequality. Mm -hmm. We had strong growth. We had strong domestic manufacturing. Unions had some power. It wasn't mm -hmm. perfect. Of course not. And lots of folks were left out of it. Um, but we know what kind of economic program can work, I think, in this country. And, you know, 
you drive around districts like mine. It doesn't take much to connect the dots between lousy trade deals, letting Wall Street dictate terms to corporate managers, uh, and seeing those factories go overseas. And that was all driven by that same ideology that says those companies have no loyalty, they have no obligation to their communities or their workers, they should ch chase the absolute maximum profit, even if that means exploited workers across the globe with horrible environmental laws in those countries. If they can turn out a little more profit, those that ideology says, well, ship your factory there. Absolutely not. And you talk to most people in places like Western Pennsylvania, they know that. They know that was a mistake and that know that hurt people like us in our community. So I, you know, I, I believe in something very different and I'm pretty honest with people about that. Well, speaking of your district, your district is neighbors with the a district in Ohio where the, that had the de, a uh, train accident in last year. It's been a, a year now in East Palestine. Um, uh, environmental disaster, uh, those people are still suffering. You have put forward uh, legislation to improve train sa safety. Um, what have you seen with that? Railway Safety Act. I, yeah. I lead in the House with a Republican colleague of mine, Nick Lalota from New York. And in the Senate, of course, our senators, Casey and Fetterman, and their Ohio counterparts, J.D. Vance, Sherrod Brown, lead it there. The bill hasn't moved, and it's a shame. You know, I they got it out of committee in the Senate, and I think they're trying to get through a Republican filibuster to, to pass it. I'm hopeful they will do that. In the House, you know, and I've got co-sponsors from both parties. I've kept it bipartisan on purpose because I want to pass this bill. And yet the Republican leadership hasn't let us move the bill at all. Uh, Why is that? I can't answer for them. I think the railroads have power. I think the powerful networks like the Cokes and others who lobby against this stuff uh, have a lot of sway with their leadership. And uh, it's a shame because communities like mine are the ones and the people who are going to pay when this happens again. I, I had the Congressional Research Service uh, look into what numbers and percents of my constituents live within five miles of the tracks, 95%. One mile of the track, it's almost half, or one mile of the tracks, almost half of my constituents. This will hurt a lot of people if this continues. Uh, and the measures we need to take to make rail, freight rail safer, they're obvious. We know what they are. The bill goes into that. Uh, it also stiffens penalties when the railroads break the rules. So, you know, I, I'm not naive. I know there are powerful forces and lots of money against guys like me who want to take on uh, rail safety. That's what my constituents expect. And uh, I don't care who it's going to be, but if someone's going to come at me uh, and expect to beat me and take the money of those kinds of groups to carry water for the big corporations who want to treat us like collateral damage, my goodness, I'll take that fight every day because I'm on the right side of protecting my constituents and my communities. Just so folks have a better understanding, what are some of those uh, improvements to safety? That this yeah, includes. so wayside defect detectors, uh, which could have prevented what happened in East Palestine, that, that kind of derailment. Um, better notifications for communities when the hazardous materials are being shipped through. Uh, changing the rules so the Department of Transportation can add materials like vinyl chloride, for instance, which was involved in East Palestine, sure. to the definition of a high hazard flammable train, which triggers more and better safety requirements for the train, speeds and otherwise stiffer fines for when the railroads break the rules. Two-person staffing. Most people will look at these big, long trains and think there are... I, you ask folks, how many people do you think is on that train? Mm -hmm. If I told you there could be one, you would you think that's crazy. There mm -hmm. could be one. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the railroads already have two, um, but the railroads lobby against two-person staffing. And just, I think, today, the Department of Transportation put out a rule to apply to a bunch of circumstances to require two-person staffing. We should enshrine that in the law. So. These kinds of provisions, which again are pretty common sense, and when you ask people about it, they think we ought to do it. The National Transportation Safety Board chair uh, talked about how these are preventable accidents uh, if we take the steps we need uh, to make rail safer. Just so people again understand why this hasn't already been implemented, who's stopping it from happening? You say there's no vote on it, but who are the forces that are preventing that vote from happening? There's a train lobby there. Who else? Well, I mean, the real people who are blocking movement are the Republican leadership in the House. They control what happens in committee, what happens on the floor. We haven't had votes or hearings or anything. And the stories are out there, of course, about the rail lobby, the network of uh, Coke 
and there there are companies and think tanks lobbying against the bill. I mean, there are public letters from these kinds of right wing, trickle down economic deregulatory groups lobbying against the Railway Safety Act, uh, which is just nuts. I mean, you've got everyone from conservative Republicans, uh, my Democratic colleagues, and people in between. J.D. Vance and I don't agree on a whole lot of stuff in Washington. We agree about the Railway Safety Act. And I think it, it speaks volumes to the fact that the people who actually represent these communities and these people expect something to change so that we are treated with dignity and respect and we're not just treated like collateral damage um, by these railroads. That's interesting you mentioned J.D. Vance because you two have a lot in common, despite the fact that you're on opposite sides of the aisle. He's a Trump supporter. You both are veterans. Um, and you have uh, uh, this this train bill in in common. Is that the kind of legislation that could help maybe narrow the divide? Because it's something that obviously someone from the other side of the aisle is, can be passionate about as well. How do we have more of these issues, and how do we have more of these types of synergies? so that we could start healing a little bit on Capitol Hill and, and then in the rest of the country. Well, I never want a crisis to be the impetus for, for this, right? But we have to do what's necessary when we have crises in front of us. Look, I, I say this to people all the time. I will look for every opportunity to do what is right for Western Pennsylvania and for this country. If it means I'm going to work with a really conservative guy like J.D. Vance, so be it. Right? That's what people should expect of us. Uh, I don't know if Democrats and Republicans working together on bills here and there is enough to really heal what's been going on, what Donald Trump has been playing with, uh, that, that danger and that fire. But I, I like to think it's part of it. It's maybe a little bit of getting back to some sense of our government can be normal and functional and healthy, um, and we aren't worried about anti-democratic forces. So I, I'm never going to shy from if there's something I can do down there that's good for this place that I call home, and it happens to be I'm working with a Republican or a Democrat, Like I, I'm always going to do that. And I think a little bit more of that could go a long way down there. Um, a little bit of putting your country and your region and your constituents first is never a bad thing. Congressman Deluzio, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Carmen, thank you. We're out. I want to thank Chris Deluzio for joining us on the Post-Industrial Podcast, and I want to thank you for either listening or viewing. Do me a favor, make sure you like and subscribe, and visit us at postindustrial.com. Thanks.